I'm Dana Sostegger. After three decades in the marketing business and many years of being an entrepreneur, I've learned a thing or two about marketing. Join me as we talk about marketing, small business, and life in between. Welcome to My Weekly Marketing. When I started my first business after leaving corporate life, I priced it accordingly. I took my former salary and divided it by 2080, which is the number of working hours in a 40-hour work week in a year, and that was my hourly rate that I charged. Boy, was that the wrong approach. But let's be honest here. I know I'm not the only one to do that. And pricing for a product-based business is even trickier. You know, your materials cost you, but what about your time and your overhead? And what about all the competition out there? How do you decide on what to charge? My guest on this week's episode is Natalie Freeman. Natalie is a business coach and pricing strategist who delivers transformational coaching to new and existing business owners to become clear on their target audience, master their messaging, and price their products and services for profit. Natalie works with creative people who have a desire to monetize their knowledge, skills, and experience by guiding, coaching, and mentoring the business owner and nurturing their business into a profitable reality. And she is driven by a mission to end the curse of the expensive hobby, which I love. I think you'll enjoy my conversation with Natalie as much as I did, and I can pretty much guarantee you're going to learn some things too. Here's my conversation with Natalie. Well, hey, Natalie, it's so nice to have you. Thank you so much, Janice. Nice to see you. So tell us a little bit about your story and your career and how you got to this point. Sure. Um, I guess it's what they call a portfolio career. So a a range of different um, jobs, different roles. But I think my particular sort of interest in terms of the the business and the the business support um, came around through volunteering actually so volunteering with a business support organization that was working um with in the UK where I am based they we used to use a term neat which meant not in education employment or training and one of the options from uh, the government's perspective was okay we can offer Um, these young people, so between 18 and 30, some money to start a business. And at that time, so we're going back quite a few few years, um, lots of creative businesses, but a lot of the money was kind of going towards £5,000 worth of music studio equipment to sort of have in in lots of young boys' bedrooms at the time. But what that did was it gave me a really deep insight into the ways that... um, individuals kind of imagine themselves in terms of business, the sorts of activities that they wanted to do and the structure towards starting a business. So from volunteering there, then when a job came up, I was able to apply, get the job. And from there, my sort of um, career in working with businesses sort of started up. And then years go past and time goes past and then sort of making a decision to go full time myself um, in terms of my own endeavours. And that's taken quite a a number of different routes as well. So um, I do catering. I'm known as Natalie the Cake Lady in certain circles, um, regards to baking. (laughs) Um, And then I sort of went into um, my own boutique. So I I had a, a boutique that I was running and that was interesting. And it's sort of where I've kind of come full circle. So working with um, independent businesses, product-based businesses that had really beautiful things that I would kind of go around and meet them at different places and say, I want you with, I want your products with me. Uh, We had an economic crash, 2008, 2007, 2008. So I was like, okay, uh, I think I'm going to have to close. And I think this is one of the, the key takeaways for me is I called my friend, mentor, uh, colleague and said oh I think I'm going to have to close the business and he said well that's your first one under your belt and that completely changed my perspective in terms of this concept around failure mm. the concept around when what what does success look like and and that really was a pivotal kind of mental shift for me um shop closed back into the workforce 
back and forth, back and forth. Um, and then still on this kind of, I think, working with un- other entrepreneurs to kind of support them and to really develop their skills. Um, I had a kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, a bit of an adventure again, volunteering, a contract ended. And then I said to a friend, I want to, I want an adventure. And she sent me this information for a volunteering program to go to Zimbabwe to act as a team leader with groups of UK volunteers matched with uh, Zimbabwean volunteers. And that was a sexual health project and was extremely interesting. And that's a whole podcast on its own, but learned loads and learned a lot about the environment there in terms of women, women's health, women's economic situations and so on. And I just said, I need to do something. And so after going and sort of working with volunteering with a different, with an organization, just then started my own social enterprise um, to deliver enterprise skills training to women, primarily in deep rural uh, Zimbabwean um, communities. And um, I think from, from, from there and with lots of different things around this enterprise support stuff, um, really recognising that that's kind of my sweet spot. It's my happy place. It's where I know that I can make a difference. And, and one of the things, I know this is quite a rambling answer, Janice, forgive me, but in one of the the things around um, when I think about the, the the skills needed to do this kind of work and, and to support people in terms of thinking about their businesses, training others when you don't share a common language was a really interesting experience oh, um, because you I was really having to think about this is is this a really complex matter? How do I make it so that my very limited Shona and the group's very fluent Shona, but limited English, um, but far more bi- bilingual than I am uh, by every stretch of the imagination. You know, how how do I make these concepts very clear? And so that was an immensely valuable experience and a life-changing one in, in many ways. But I think that is a very rambling kind of meander into exactly a range of different steps that have kind of got me to this place now, which is running 13 Rhythms, which um, is the name of my business um, uh, in terms of like its legal entity, but I guess I'm Natalie, a business coach, Um, but uh, really working with encouraging, cheerleading, guiding, advising business owners who often need a range of um, interventions from cheerleading, from information, a bit of a push, a lot of a challenging sometimes, some confidence building, and then the nuts and bolts of this is how you take your creative skills and turn it into a business. So that is a bit of a, a plotted history. Hopefully that was useful. It's fine, but there will be some key things that will just, I just make sure that I repeat throughout because that's the the thing that I want someone to take away with them. So that's just that understanding about the way that our, as humans, how we work. You know? mm-hmm. That's very true. So you now are you're a business coach, but you also call yourself a pricing strategist. How did the pricing part come in? to play and how, I mean, obviously it, it comes in any business, but how is it uh, something that you focus on? Is it a passion of yours or how did you land there? From seeing lots of creative businesses with amazing skills, amazing talents and rubbish. Pri- so that's a very English thing. Sorry. Um, really bad pricing. Um, so I think that there are a number of, I think, tropes that exist within, um, I suppose, with creatives and creative business owners, which is one is around the struggling artist. And so as a creative, there is a sense of honour in some ways where you can be very skilled, but you're not going to make any money because that's what true creativity, true artistry is about. And, and And I used to see that a lot from all my years back um, in that first role that I mentioned working as a volunteer and then in the paid roles, et cetera, this kind of feeling that lots of creatives have that they're not a genuine artist if they're getting paid well for what they do. That was the first thing. Mm -hmm. 
The second thing was um, just looking at and listening to um, uh, business owners who were working full time. So then what happened in their case was they didn't pay any attention to the numbers. They didn't pay any attention to their prices in their business because their job was supporting their life and their lifestyle. So recognizing that they had the 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 bones of a business idea, maybe even selling to to customers and and clients, but actually not really thinking about it from any sort of a sustainable business model because of their job. And because their salary was covering things, they were like, well, I don't have to separate my money. I don't have to think about my prices. You know, I'm all right. And I'm like, okay, this is something also that needs to be tackled. Mm -hmm. And I guess the the pricing strategist bit um, that I've, yeah, sort of talk about is because numbers and pricing isn't just about um, saying these are my numbers or these are my prices and then I'm going to put them up. What's your messaging? How are you going to communicate what it is that you offer? How are you going to talk about the the transformation that your products provide? Also, um, who is your target audience? So if you've got the right product at the right price in front of the wrong people, you're not going to have a sustainable business. So the, the strategist bit comes in is, you know, as a business coach, of course, talking about pricing is is in there. But the reason I wanted to give this sort of pricing strategy thing was just to, I suppose, spark that thought process in the minds of people that I work with or people that come across me online, just to say that when you're thinking about your prices, it's not just the numbers, it's the target audience, it's the product, it's where you're selling, it's how you're selling, it's in your messaging. And so that's the strategy bit that kind of goes alongside the the numbers. Um and it's not just pulling numbers out of the air either. You really do need to be somewhat strategic when it comes mm-hmm. to your price. Yeah. And I think especially when we're just starting out and we may have a background in something, um, a lot of people work in corporate world for for a while and then they decide to become a coach or a consultant or something like that. And so it's hard to price it, even though they have years and years of experience, they think, well, I'm going to lose this job if I don't price this competitively or price it low so I can get more clients. And I think, you know, that obviously you kind of shoot yourself self in the foot by doing that because a business exists to make a profit. And even, I, I think I see this so, so often with not only clients, but uh, just generally just chatting with people uh, and especially products, they will say, well, to be competitive, I'm going to price it less than these people over here. But I like what you said about the perceived value as well, because what, what happens is that becomes a commodity item and it's a race to the bottom if you start pricing it lower and lower, right? So it, it reminds me of, uh, you know, a, a, a market day, you know, where everybody is selling tomatoes and, uh, you know, so they are just all the same tomato. What sets yours apart from the booth next to yours, for example? Mm-hmm. So um, I, I love that you mentioned that because I think we really do get hung up on pricing. I know I got hung up on pricing for sure, and I still kind of struggle with it. So I really have to take a step back and say, okay, let's look at the big picture here. What do I need to uh, charge to be competitive and yet to make my ends meet, to it really has to start with a big picture rather than just say, well, I just do this on weekends um, or on the side, I just decorate cakes or whatever. You know, it, it's something that really does require a strategy. So mm-hmm. how do you go about doing that? How do you, where do you start with a, a pricing strategy? Mm. I start with with this. I love what you said about the race to the bottom. You sort of said it before me, so that's brilliant. I like that we're there in in our in our thinking. Um, I start with this statement, and I've been saying it a lot lately, um, which is that nobody needs most of the products that I, in fact, all of the products of the clients that I work with, and they all, you know, class with it a chest and think, how very dare you say such a thing. But I say, well, you don't sell water. And even if you did sell water, we could get water out of our taps if we live in places where you can get water from a tap. And you don't sell air. Other other than those two things, you know, 
nobody needs what you have. And I say that not to crush anybody's ego, but just to kind of really bring that realization in, which is you are now, if nobody needs what you have, that means that we are trading in wants. And that means we therefore have to inspire somebody to want the product that we are offering. Okay. So as much as I might see a hundred businesses a day that I think I could do that, that and that, change that strategy, sort out their marketing, they're this, they're this. Nobody needs a business coach. Okay. So they choose to 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 want one. So for for product businesses, for for a lot of us in this, in these um in these services and product worlds, we then once we understand that nobody needs what we have now, we can start to think about, okay, so therefore what is the int- what is the value in my product? And not from a value for money perspective, but what transformation does this product provide? In what way is it going to enhance the person who's buying it? In what way is it going to enhance them? If it's a product that they will personally use, how will it enhance their home? If it's a product for the home or their office or whatever it is, and really thinking through those key points that will become your major selling points. Of course, we have to start with kind of the basics in terms of the cost of production, the cost of goods, um, all of the um, costs that are involved in terms of creating a product or getting and getting it from you to a customer. Okay. But that's a, a model which they often call um, cost plus profit. So you've worked out your costs and then you're going to say, well, I'm going to have a 50%, 100%, 150% profit margin. The big issue is that for most people, they never include their time in mm-hmm. those pricing calculations. So I see lots of, again, lots of posts online where someone will say, well, I'm a baker. I was five pounds in um, ingredients and uh, five pounds um, in postage and packaging. That's 10 pounds. And then I sold them for 20 pounds. I made a 10 pounds profit. And of course you didn't. There's no contribution in there towards your overhead. There's nothing in there for your time, et cetera. So it is about, uh, first of all, understanding your your numbers. And that's, that's a massive key thing. Lots of people are very afraid of numbers. I don't particularly love maths. You couldn't give me a trigonometry question, but if it's about um, this, these numbers, then I'm 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 good with that. And I think that again, for lots of people, there there is that kind of I was awful at maths at school, so I don't really want to I don't really want to think about it. And I can definitely understand some of that, but then we have to work through that to get to your business mm-hmm. and to have a business, and then we can start to build in. Um, these those other much more I guess ethereal points around okay now we're talking about value now we're thinking about your target audience who are you selling to what is it about what you have um, that you can inspire somebody to want this thing so I use the the value-based pricing model which isn't based on any sort of fixed equation but is is looking at your product your target audience um, sort of their expectations the ways that you're going to sell, not everybody is motivated by price. And really, once you understand that, then you can start to think about what is going to make sense for you in terms of your goals, your aspirations, your income goals, what you want to do with your business. Do you want to stay doing this on the side? Would Do you ever want to do it full time? And then it's a lot of reverse engineering from that's what I want to earn. How, now you have a product. How many can you create? How many can you sell? And then what, to whom are you going to be selling it? And now we can start to look at the numbers. So again, this is where all of that strategy stuff comes in. Much lesser, here are some numbers, go with them. But actually looking at all of those factors to actually get to the to the prices that make sense for the business. Hmm. Do you recommend people use pricing tiers sometimes as well? Or do you feel like... There's, I suppose, a product, products, there's probably less of that than services because it's hard to add products or bundle them, I suppose. Bundling things for sure. Thinking about um, ways that you can increase your, your, um, your average order spend. So certainly thinking about, uh, if I have this conversation on a live 
uh, last week that somebody was saying, should I offer free postage and should I offer free shipping? She was in America. Should I offer free shipping on my products? And I said, well, if your business can absorb that cost, that makes sense. But on an individual unit of, I think it was about $8. And then your your shipping is $5. What's the perception of that to your customer? So instead, sell three items as a minimum. That increases the order value. Then you can potentially offer postage and packing and all of this. So I think that there are often ways of thinking about how do we bundle things? How do we make things make sense to our businesses? And how do we make a um, make decisions that are also attractive to our customers? as well. And that customer is really, always, when I'm working with a client, that's the first place we start is who's the, that customer that you really want to be reaching and develop a profile around them and, and get to know them. Uh, one thing comes to mind in the U.S., we have a uh, chain of shoe stores called Payless Shoes. And what they did is several years ago, and I, I, I don't know who did this, or I think it was some kind of a marketing gimmick or something like that. But they changed the name of the store in one location to like pay less a or something like that. So it sounded very upscale, put the same shoes in that, in that store and charged way, way more than they pay at the discount version of it. And, mm-hmm. and people bought it. I mean, it was really all about how it was branded, how it was positioned and that target us customer that they were aiming for. So I think that's something that we really need to keep in mind. There's, if I'm going to pay $5 for a candle or $25 for a candle or more, it, it, it really depends on the customer. If you are looking for a customer who is just value focused, then again, you're going to have to charge more, less than if you are going for a higher, I don't want to say higher income person mm-hmm. that can buy it. So yeah. I've, absolutely, Janice. And I, again, I love that example because you, we don't need, so if you've got paler short stores in America for shoes, we'll have the equivalent here in, in, um, in terms of like all of the different products. And then in England, we have a shop called Poundland. Mm-hmm. And so Poundland is literally like a dollar, dollar tree, mm-hmm. I think, maybe equivalent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So if I want a candle, I could go into Poundland and buy, you know, three packs of, I don't know, what is that? Six inch tall candles if I want them in case there's a power cut. If I'm buying a candle that's scented in a beautiful jar and all of the rest of it, it's unlikely that I'm thinking, you know, I've got 10 pounds or $10, sell me a candle for $10. At that point, I'm already clear that I'm buying an experience. I want to maybe smell something I've never smelled before or I want the the candle to fit into an aesthetic. I'm not focused at that point on the price. And so for most of the businesses that I'm coming across that I'm working with, they are in that niche of creating products that are experiential, that are about some sort of igniting of the senses, making you feel good when you put something on, making your hair feel nice if you wash your hair, making your skin feel nice. And so at that point, whether it's five pounds or 20 pounds is then an interesting question because if somebody's that invested in whatever it is that you're offering, your job as the business is to build in that sense of the the benefits, the transformation, how that person's going to feel selling on the emotions as opposed to leading with price. You can't lead with price on a 20 pounds candle because that that's po- like it's literally pointless. Yeah. Right, right. Although, you know, also I think sometimes there's that perceived cachet, and this is sort of similar to what you were saying. So I love that, that you were making that analogy that you can go to, well, in the UK, like Barks and Spencers and yeah. pay a lot of money for a candle, yeah. or you can go to Pound Tree or what was Pound? Uh, Pound Lab. <laughs> Pound thank you. And, or Boots Pharmacy and, and buy one for much less. And, uh, it, it, and sometimes it can be that that feeling like you almost value that that more expensive candle more because you paid more for it, and also you feel good about it because you could give it. You might want to give it as a gift, and you want them to think highly of you because you can tell that they paid a lot for that candle or whatever. So mm-hmm. there's so much psychology that goes into pricing. I think that we sometimes kind of miss when we're just looking at the raw numbers. 
Yeah. So I love that you that you brought that up. How important is like doing market research when you're setting your prices? I think it's it's important, but it's also a little bit of a of a double edged sword. And particularly if somebody is fairly new starting out, the challenge is is that they'll look at lots and lots of other businesses and sometimes get a bit frozen with I don't know what to do. Everything is so different. Somebody's, you know, got this very expensive product. Someone else has got a cheap product. I don't know where I fit in. I have a lot of clients that talk about the some of the challenges with Etsy, um, purely in the sense of, well, some people have this for this price and other businesses seem to be selling it at that price. And I and I often say to them, you don't know the condition of, of that business. You don't know if it's a real kind of independent business owner. You don't know if it's a massive factory masquerading. You don't know if that business owner themselves are making um, profit when they have such low prices. So I think um, market research is important to a point. And then there has to be a stage at which you, you do kind of... Um, almost put it aside and make some decisions of your own based on where you feel your product fits into a marketplace, where it fits into the the sort of the imagination of your target audience. Um, and just, yeah, like I say, just kind of making a decision. The the difference between um one, like you said, one one payless shoe in the payless store and then the same shoe in the um the the French sounding, you know, shop, the same product, it's what's spoken about the product that makes the difference. And so I think, yes, absolutely, market research is crucial. Um, and I always give it a timed um, period so that we don't kind of get lost in a endless sense of analysis of other competitors. So a very fixed period of time to do some very specific activities and then to kind of come back to what is your own brand? What are your own ethics? What's your own ethos? And who is it again that you're, you're aiming to sell to in terms of that target audience? Um and so it's it's a yes to the market research and a yes and let's move on once mm-hmm. we have that grounding before we get lost in an endless sort of, of comparison. So do the research, absorb the information, make your decision and then walk away. <laughs> Pretty much, yes. <laughs> um, so it, are there some mistakes that you see that businesses make when they're calculating their pricing and their margins? I know we've talked about some of them probably, but are there some that you see on a regular basis that you kind of want to warn people about? Yep. Yes. (laughs) So not considering your time, not considering all of your, your costs, not having anything in your prices as a contribution towards your overhead. So businesses cost money to run um, beyond your raw materials to create your products. Um, having the the right product at the right price in front of the wrong audience, I would call that a pricing problem. And I think finally, which is one of those mindset ones, is not being able to own your price and to state your prices confidently. Yes. And so, right. So mm-hmm. often one of the exercises that I give to, to, to clients, and I, I talk about this as well in terms of some of my content, is that ability to say your prices and pause. And I think I don't I think we may have, have talked about this before, mm-hmm. Jack, but it's that that feeling that often comes when maybe you've got a new price. When you're saying it for the first time. When you know what your product is and you're going to put it out there and you're going to state your price and then you get the dry mouth and your stomach starts to churn. And if you say that price and keep talking, the chances are, the risks are, believe me, I know because I've done this myself, is you then start to talk yourself out of the price. 
Mm -hmm. So the price is for the the price for the handmade crocheted handbag is um it's a hundred pounds, but because it's you, I know you, I can do it for fifty. And actually, because you've been you've been such a great friend to me, I'll do it for you for thirty. And if you tell someone about me in the future, then I'll actually do it for twenty. And before you know it, you've talked yourself out of the price. Whereas if you say price and pause. Let the sicky feeling happen in your stomach. Let the mouth get dry, but just stop yourself from talking yourself out of the price because you've not actually let the person even respond. So when you say the price and then you start talking, they're like, is it 100? Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? Whereas if you say it and pause, you're letting your, your potential person, your, your potential customer, hear it, absorb it, and make a, dif- and make a decision. So I think that is one of the key things. We can do all of the stuff we want to do with the numbers, but if you don't believe that you are worth that price and you're not able to confidently state that price, it's it's going to feel like a struggle. So I'm not saying that everybody starts off with this confidence. I certainly have put up my prices since I've started and I definitely know that across a range of my different business endeavors that my numbers weren't exactly where they should be. So I'm speaking about this definitely (laughs) place of experience. But what I for sure do know and understand is that if business business owners don't own the price, I say, say it with your chest, say it confidently, say those numbers confidently, Mm. uh, then you're always really going to have a tough time getting people to to spend with you to invest with you invest in your products because you don't believe it and therefore it's it's never going to sound convincing to others that's a really good point because you're right if you don't if, if you state it and then you start backtracking offering a discount or whatever they're going to think that it's not worth that price that you just stated that's really interesting um i've certainly done it myself and friends are the worst I mean, because I think they almost kind of expect to discount some time. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't want to destroy a friendship by not giving them a discount. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you handle that? Do you have, have you had clients? Oh, good yeah. I, well, well, interestingly, so I, I know lots of people that, that run their own business, but I, I, I don't talk about business to them mm-hmm. because, because, um, it can ruin friendships. And and I say, also say to clients, I've had clients say to me, Natalie, my friends, they don't share my stuff on social. They don't um, leave comments and everyone's very caught up in this likes and follows and um, engagement stuff. And I think we're, we're definitely drowning in a sea of you have to have high numbers. I'm like, you don't have to have high numbers. You have to have a number of people that are potentially going to become customers or clients of your products or services. So I think that lots of people will talk about my friends don't do this and my friends don't do that. And I go so far as to say you can unfriend your friends from your business online accounts because that's going to save you from all of that stress. I am quite ruthless (laughs) in terms of how I'm cultivating my my social media pages, I'm keeping it absolutely clear and crisp that it is um, product-based businesses. So I don't even really have service-based businesses. Um, When I started on TikTok, I think a year ago, when I was like, TikTok, that's for children, surely. It's actually been really interesting in terms of, in terms of my business and, and, and getting clients from TikTok. But I was so clear at that point that I'm product based only and I've I've just cultivated that audience alone. I don't say, well, I'm just going to add my friends or when it says at the start of the account, sync your contacts. Absolutely not. Just Mm -hmm. keep it and grow it with the audience that you want. And you're going to save yourself a lot of that headache or that heartache sometimes from, well, my friends aren't doing this or my friends want a discount or my friends, my friend. And you're also going to have that opportunity of not having an inflated um, uh, number of people because it's kind of, your list is sort of filled with friends and family who won't buy from you, who aren't your target audience. Some of them might be, some of them might fit that profile, but many of them may not. And so I think there is a 
people really agonize over my friends haven't done this when they start their businesses. And and again, maybe it's just, that, again, a mindset shift to say, keep your friends as your friends, value that relationship as it is and look elsewhere, look elsewhere for clients, look elsewhere for customers. Because mm-hmm. um, I, I just think that that's healthier. And and I, as I save, I know I could, I, there's lo- loads of friends who are businesses. I'm like, okay, that's not, are you doing that? Fantastic. And I leave it there. I I don't want a fractious conversation. I don't want, I I don't want any of that. So if I'm all different, but just to generally offer, I've learned the discipline actually of not just randomly offering people wisdom mm-hmm. as I see it, because they're like they may not want it. <laughs> right, right. And I think the other side of that is friends that are in business that you don't really probably bring up your business too, but they just kind of want to invite you out for coffee to maybe pick your brain a little bit. And um, which is also very hard. I mean, I I think in those cases, I offer a a small amount of information and then I maybe invite them, put them on my email list or invite them into a program. Um, But I'm still terrible. I just did this a couple of weeks ago where I gave a friend a discount on um, some consulting work. And it was, it was, I I couldn't not do it. So I I apparently have some work to do with that one. (laughs) So how do you uh, deal with uh, pricing discounts, for example, or uh, we talked about friends discounts, but what about promotions and discounts without eroding the profit margin that comes with doing that? Mm -hmm. Lovely question. Um, So I think that the, the, the key thing is setting those prices at the at the beginning so that you have a healthy margin um and i think for lots of for lot again for lots of business owners they haven't done their pricing correctly so then there is no wiggle room for for discounts one of the things that i that i like to say is that when you think about a discount i want i encourage um uh, people to think of it as a gift. So when you're giving a discount, it's like saying to somebody that maybe um, has bought before and is coming back to your business to buy from you again. Um, this is my gift to you as somebody that is a somebody that has purchased from me before, as opposed to I'm going to give money off so I get lots of sales. They're quite different thought processes um and again I suppose I'm quite pedantic about words and I I love words I probably use too many (laughs) from time to time other than that time in in zim but there is a um I think that, that that sometimes again we we misunderstand or I think that people misunderstand what it is when you're offering a promotional offer or a promotional discount or money off I say you don't have to do a money off immediately. Um, I think lots of people, you go on their website and then there's that pop-up box that's popping up all over the page before you've had an opportunity to look around the website. Maybe just time that a bit more, maybe have it a little bit more discreetly in a corner on the website rather than it pops up and then you've got to find the X and click off the X and then it pops up again and Mm -hmm. customer journey wise, that's not great. So instead of always thinking money off is going to inspire somebody to buy, which is often where that comes from, think about it as a gift. So maybe your first purchase, it's just a first purchase. Once somebody now is in your business, they're on your mailing list, you have a way of connecting to them. Maybe at different intervals, you can then say, here is 15%. I don't I don't believe in anything less than 15%. I always think it feels a bit um uh 15% and above and really think strategically about how you can use those discounts um or those promotional offers or those VIP offers which again you're building in that language you're making the person the recipient of that email of that money off of that voucher that coupon whatever it is you're making them feel seen mm-hmm. People are saying that this is something that I would like to offer you as a as a gift for being um, one of our customers, and it's to kind of think about it in that way. So if you're looking at a twelve month period, you can then plot when would you like this activity to happen, um, and your mindset is that it's not going to just be kind of an everybody all the time 
all the time, but it might be that you may have introductory offers with a launch list, with a pre-list. Then it might be once somebody is a customer, then they have other opportunities which entice them, entice incentivize them to purchase again from you but just really switching up that whole thought process again around the discount and the money off because again for lots of businesses that I speak to they see it as the reason why somebody will buy they'll buy from me if it's got 10% off and I'm like they won't because we're back to the 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 100 pound jacket if someone's going to buy a jacket for hundred pounds, they're kind of going to buy a jacket for a hundred pounds. Your ten percent off isn't the reason why they will or won't mm-hmm. at that price point. So it, it's about think thinking that just think. Often I'm like, well, okay, if we think about it, and we actually think about what it is that we're we're trying to achieve, then you'll sometimes see the gaps. But I think with so much content that we're all me too, you know, that we're all kind of fed so often have a discount have a sale have okay fine that's what they say now let's think it through think about the impact on your business can your business absorb any sort of a sale because are your prices the right prices in the first place so again again this sort of strategy question comes in which is discounts I, I'll call always call them like a promotional offer or a special offer I just think discounts is a different uh animal kind of supermarket type talk and also then thinking about it from the perspective of this is your gift to a customer. Hmm. I like that. Yeah. I think oftentimes I will recommend that pop-up initially when someone visits your site to get them on your email list. In Mm -hmm. which case that is at least strategically um, because 10% off or 15% off is probably not you sh- you should hopefully have that baked into your pricing so that it's not going to kill the sale or or kill your your profit margin on that sale. Mm-hmm. But also, I love what you said about the strategy behind it because there are many times where you want to stand out. You really want to motivate that person to buy, uh, even after they are a customer, or they were a customer, or maybe they've been on your list a while and they haven't purchased and they need that little nudge, or maybe uh, there's a, a a big Black Friday sale. So you know that everybody is going to be discounting something. So you're going to need that to be competitive. So I love what you say about being strategic with it, because I think that's super important Um, in everything we do in marketing. Strategy is is key, but I love that what you said about that. So um, do you have some tools or resources that you recommend for businesses looking to just refine their pricing strategies? Yes, yeah, so I've created a, a pricing calculator um, and you put in your email and then you get the calculator, talking about email. Um, then it's kind of, it's just free access. But essentially what it, it has is, and they're, 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 they're like that pricing calculators exist. But what I really love with mine, and I worked with a developer to create this, um, was um you enter in all of your numbers so your your num- your raw materials your um contribution to your overhead your packaging your postage if applicable your staff costs if applicable your time goes in yes and then you get a subtotal and then there's a box and you add in your chosen profit margin and then it gives you a final kind of uh, price for your products. So you can either do it by the individual product or by the batch. So if you make, I don't know, 24 cupcakes at a time, it will tell you the batch price, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And what I love about it is it makes the person think through, these are all of my costs and my time. And then I have a number and then I add my profit margin on top. Because as we said earlier, Janice, so many people are thinking about, well, I I, I I made it for £10 and I sold it for 20 so I've made profit. And it's like, actually, you've done that work for free and nobody should be working for free. That definitely not when you're running your own business. Mm-hmm. And so I, I re- what I really love about it, beyond the functionality, so you can put all your numbers in and it, it will just continue to churn out different numbers. Whoever the guy who created it was is amazing because um, it's formulas and stuff like that. 
Mm-hmm. So you can play with different profit margins, different prices for your, so in the, the, the time for your, um, how you charge your time, it's by the hour. So you can play with all of these numbers and really get a sense of where you should be in terms of being profitable. And I think that it's also that process of business costs. Your time is not negotiable and then your profit and then you can see, you know, what what that price is is actually should should be. Um, and I say should in the sense of if you want to be a profitable business and not have an expensive hobby, which is the danger that a lot of businesses have. They have businesses that actually cost them money to be part of. Um, and so that that is kind of the starting point for um, for for what I do. It kind of gets people thinking. It helps them to see the numbers in a non-threatening way. It kind of does all of the or it does a lot of the um, working out for you. And lots of people say, oh, my goodness, I had no idea that I should be here um, in terms of what the numbers should be. And if that's the case and you're we're really far off that. Well, then now we need to think about what is your strategy going to be? Who are you going to be selling to? Do you need to revise your product? Sometimes, you know, certain products can hold um, a certain, when I say hold a certain price, do you know what I mean when I say that? Like they they can comfortably ch- be charged at a certain price. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, more easily than other products. So sometimes it's a case of, well, then let's rethink maybe what your products are so that you can have something that's a bit more profitable than having, you know, lots of little things at, at $5, for example. That could be fine if you're selling thousands of them. But if you're not at that scale, at that price point, then we need to think differently in terms of where you're going to be making your money on a month to month basis. So once you're, again, I think it's this clarity around the numbers. Once you see them, you're really looking Mm -hmm. at them. And then you take a deep breath in and then you think, right, okay, so what am I really doing here with this business? And so that's the the really great starting point is it's either going to be, yep, great. I can just change this and this and this, and I know I'm on track or, wow, I've got a lot to do. And then we can start to move forward in terms of the next steps. Oh, I love that so much. I will be getting your calculator (laughs) and recommending it to to clients because that sounds amazing. I'll send the link. I have learned so much, Natalie. Thank you so much for joining me today. I think uh, my listeners will feel the same way that you've just really clarified a lot of mysteries there are in pricing because it's something that we don't really talk a lot about either. Um, So I love that you gave us your best tips and I'll put the link to everything that we talked about in the show notes. Brilliant. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Well, I think Natalie covered it all, don't you? To get the link to Natalie's pricing calculator and anything else we talked about in the podcast today, go ahead and visit the show notes page at myweeklymarketing.com forward slash 65. That's episode 65. Thank you so much for joining us today. As always, if you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.